Jesus, we are thankful to be with you today. We are thankful to hear your word, thankful to see the depth of your love. As you heal a man in front of the Pharisees who try to set a trap, Lord, you teach us that great, deep love that you had to care for us. In the midst of all of our trials and challenges, Lord, your forgiveness, your mercy, and your peace, we pray that you would fill us as a congregation, as Mount Calvary, as your people, to be prepared to love those in this world. There are so many hurting, so many who need your love, Lord. Fill us now with these wonderful words of the psalm we sang, to be ready to love all people, all nations that you put before us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we focus on the, the remaining part of our discipleship model, love one, we've gone through that kind of filling through worship and through reading God's word and through prayer and our relationship with the Lord where we hear his word spoken inside of us. We hear the negative soundtracks that come, the, the sinful challenges of this world, and the turning down that volume, turning up the volume of God as he speaks to us about who we are and how much he loves us and what he fills us with. And in the final part of the discipleship model, how do we live that out? How do we create a holy habit to, to love those that God puts before us? John Acuff, in the book about soundtracks that we've been using throughout this series, does a kind of weird twist at the final end of the book. He talks about using some kind of symbol to help him when he's trying to break a habit or start something new. He comes up with a specific problem where he notices he's holding his phone too much as he's driving. We can maybe relate to this. And so he tries to break this habit because his daughter will soon be driving and he doesn't want to set a bad example. He goes to the bank and he purchases a bunch of gold coins. And he, anytime that he wants to pick up his phone, he uses one of those gold coins. And, and when he's made it through a successful drive, he pays himself a gold coin. One day he's so excited that he's broken this habit, he doesn't pick up his phone as much anymore, and he, he's accumulated these gold coins. He goes to his wife, and, and with great joy and great excitement, he says, hey, here's how many gold coins I have. I've done this 10 days in a row, 20 days in a row. And she says, you do realize you're paying yourself with your own money. And he, he stops for a minute, and he freezes, and he realizes like maybe many of us have with a spouse or a friend, when they catch us in that odd behavior that we feel excited about, but because they know us so well, they know right where to challenge us and question us, and he's humbled in that moment. But it works. And there's something about this symbol practice that works for him. Instead of trying to force it into how does that fit for us as we try and love people in the world, there's still something to be said about understanding the challenge of loving the people before us. And what can we do? What, what do we need to look at in order to realize why is it hard for us to love people? How does that negative soundtrack or that negative habit sneak into our lives and what do we do about it? What negative soundtracks sneak into our lives every day? You know, Wednesday was a big day to just watch as a negative soundtrack snuck into the lives of people. It was the day all the loan forgiveness stuff came out from our government. And people immediately responded in all sorts of ways. And specifically, I watched that on social media and all sorts of ways that people wanted to go out and express their opinion as soon as they could. And as I've said before, I've watched this. And, and it's challenging. It's frustrating as a pastor. Because what negative soundtrack is sneaking in? Selfish soundtracks. You may say, well, I have these answers, and I have these things, and I have these ideas of, of what really should be done, and how it should be properly taken care of, and, and all of these thoughts, but what's the overall goal when we go out and we, we blast that? What are we trying to accomplish as we post that publicly? We're trying to get someone to either uh, respond to us and encourage us and say, yeah, you have the right idea. You have the better idea. You are the self 
person with all of your right thinking and to be encouraged in that, or we're trying to get into a conversation to win the argument and, and to respond in that way. And so you see this self-focus of this. There's nothing beneficial or healthy that comes in any of those conversations. Instead, they become tearing down and not loving other people and not thinking about other people at all, but merely just trying to focus on ourselves in that. And we see so much in that. And you say, well, but pastor, what about, there are these answers of maybe how the government could do this better. And I would say, if you look in scripture, you could see that that God warned us of this. He warned us that kings and earthly leaders would do things that are not healthy and proper and, and for the best benefit, and they would be also selfish and focused, and they would take our taxes and they would spend them in their dollars in the way that they intended, and that's what he speaks to us in 1 Samuel. And so you can see all of those challenges, and what it comes back to is a self-focus, a selfishness that we have in all of these ideas to try and think about the best way that we know how to do it, instead of stopping and asking the question, wait a minute, how do we love the people that have differences than us, that maybe haven't been blessed the way we have from the inheritance we have or the gifts we have or all the blessings, and we come back to the focus to say, well, well, the Lord is the one who blesses with that. How do we respond in that way? Instead, do we become like the Pharisees? Are we just like the Pharisees trying to set a trap? A trap to prove that we're right or that we have the right answers or we know the best way of thinking. If you look at our gospel reading today, you see this trap the Pharisees are trying to set. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him with dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. And then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that had fallen into a well on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out. And they could not reply to these things. You see, as we look at the difference of the examples of what is here, and we use our own personal example of what happens immediately when people respond with something they're frustrated in the world, and they're frustrated with how the leaders have handled things, and they want to go out and they express their opinions to stop for a minute and say, wait, what would you do for the person who has fallen in the well, the ox, the boy, the the son that you have? How would you care for them? And while we may have our own ideas and opinions and, and understandings of how to express that, and certainly in a country we know where we're allowed to do that by voting or protesting or writing to our representative, a moment where we stop and say, wait, how is it that we would love the people before us? All people, the people struggling in many different ways. What would God call and have us to do in loving them? But what trap are the Pharisees truly trying to set? And are they trying to set a trap? If you look into it and you see the details here, you can see that the, the Pharisees have brought this sick man to their house, this man with dropsy. And you say, well, what is dropsy? Dropsy is where there's fluid that goes into the thing and makes a part of the body larger, often in the feet or the hands. We call it a different word today. But that's what's going on here in this healing. And so would the Pharisees have typically brought this person to their dinner? Would they, in, in their selfish understanding, as we've seen them many times throughout Scripture, would they have brought this person to the table? Would they have brought this person to be at their house, or are they bringing this person to their house for a point? To trap Jesus, to see if Jesus will take him and heal him on the Sabbath. And the more you look into the details and you look into the Pharisees' behavior, you see that they fall into that negative soundtrack, that selfishness that's just looking for that moment to jump onto Jesus. Now you can stop for a minute and ask, is there any truth to this behind this? And there are no laws that talk about specifically healing on the Sabbath. And so all throughout the beginning of Scripture that talks about what to do and what not to do on the Sabbath, all of those different things, there's no laws in there about it. But in the Pharisees, self-righteous thinking, knowing what's best, the negative soundtrack has snuck into their lives and they're living it out ready to trap Jesus and prove that they are more right. They are so focused on proving that they're right. And we can see how we can fall into that trap too. 
It's the temptation of humanity. It's the temptation because we are sinful people to prove that we have figured things out, that we are right, to lift ourselves up. And it becomes then, therefore, a challenge as we get into a, talking about the discipleship middle. How do I love the people in front of me that are right there in my presence every single day? What can I do if we're not going to use this A cuff? plan to use a symbol and flip a coin how do we prep ourselves to empty our desires to prove ourselves right and fill ourselves with the desire to love other people i'm going to use a very simple basic example that happened to me this week i was thinking about it as i was preparing this message it was wednesday Wednesday, Mindy had asked me to go and take some bunt cakes to uh, Word of Life teachers who she misses and loves, and I had a few of our Word of Life clothes to drop off there as we transition into our new school. And so we went and we purchased those bunt cakes, thankfully from uh, Nothing Bunt Cakes, who blesses our preschool and our church with our fundraisers. And so I went in there and I thanked the, the manager for, for blessing us with our fundraiser last year and, and what a wonderful event it was and we're so thankful for them. And then I proceeded to Word Alive where I dropped off the bunt cakes and the clothes and, and all these wonderful ways that I was trying to love people. And then I had been looking for a dresser for a while, so on our way home, we, we, I had been looking different places, Amazon and Walmart and Target, and I was like, I'm going to go see. I know Big Lots has some furniture that can be more affordable. I'm, let, me, let me see if I find something there. And so I find the dresser I want. I have to wait for the furniture guy to come out and go back as I'm watching Ellie bump the cart into all the different furniture and trying to stop her and from her doing that and... Uh, so I wait for him. He finally comes out. I'm trying to be very loving to him and patient as he moves it up to the front and gets there. I'm looking for a few groceries we need as we wait upon him to do a few final things, and then we get up there. And he stops me and he asks me, hey, what are you guys doing today? And well, so I share. We bought some bunk cakes for some people, and we have one, and we're going to go take one home. And he said, well, that'll put a smile on anybody's face. And that line stuck with me. And I was like, okay, that's, that's what, a, what a comment of, of just thinking about what that is. So he wheels the furniture out to my car, and as he's wheeling it, all of a sudden this feeling comes over me that this bunt cake that I purchased one for Ellie and one for me, and that I should give it to him. And I try to fight it off. I try and say, well, I've loved a lot of people today. There's a lot of other ways I've loved one today. I'm fighting off this feeling, you know, I really like this one bun cake. And so and then he puts it in my car, and we talk a little bit more. And he said, it's really heavy. And I said, it's okay, I have sons at home. And he asked me about my sons. And, and he's, he's driving back, and I'm like, okay, it's, it's okay. He's taking the cart back to the thing. I think, it's okay. I've still loved one. I didn't open the cake. And then at the last minute, I say, fine. And I go open the bag, and I give him the bun cake, and I say, hey, I hope this will give you a good day and, and, and make you excited for the day, and I, and I hand him the cake. The reason I tell you that story is because sometimes loved one is an exhausting battle. It seems like such a simple story, but it's the truth of what we're trying to talk about as we live out as Mount Calvary extraordinary servants in the world. It isn't just, oh, I've loved this person over here. I've loved my family. I've loved these neighbors over here. I've loved these teachers that I, I cared for. But it's an exhausting battle sometimes with my selfish behavior. We, in the Lutheran church, we like to talk that as sinner and saint language. And saint language means that we know that we're loved by Jesus and we are his children. We are forgiven children of God in baptism, and so we live that out, having the wonderful blessings of the Lord. At the same time, we fight that we are saints, or we are sinners, and we are, we are sinners who battle sin every single day. We, are, we battle sin in ourselves to think about ourselves first. We get out of bed and we think, what, what do I need to worry about with me today? And then maybe we, we pass it a little bit more on our, our family or our spouse or our friends or things like that. But when it gets into the people at Big Lots, the people that stand before us with this opportunity to love them, sometimes it becomes challenging. But I do believe this is where the church is going. I do believe that this is what an unchurched culture looks like. we got to get back to grassroots loving. 
It's one person at a time. It's not throw a big party at church and hope everybody shows up and comes there and then we'll love them there. It's grassroots loving. It's loving the people before us. And yes, it starts in places like social media where I have seen some of you be extraordinary servants and put comments on people and love people and and respond in that way. And that's a wonderful way to use social media, to love people in that way but also the people before us every single day. And we don't know when they'll show up into this building to hear the Word of God, but it's back to us as God has called us to be His extraordinary servants to love. And when we say, well, how do we do that? When it's such an exhausting battle, when there's so many people to love each single day. And that's where we talk about the negative sound and transferring them to hear God's Word, to fill us with His Word. Empty us, Lord, all that selfishness that we feel every single day. Empty us, and we come in confession like we do today. We come in confession in the morning, and we say, Lord, fill us. And that is where Psalm 67 comes to. If you listen to the beginning of Psalm 67, it's that beginning emptying prayer and filling prayer to fill us with who God is. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face shine upon us that Your way may be known on earth your saving power among all nations. This is a prayer. Just forgive us, Lord. Empty us with this. Fill us. Bless us. And make your face shine upon us so that we're ready to love those people and that they can see your saving power among all nations. They can feel your love through our actions. It goes on further to even fill us even more. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For for you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. This is a prayer that every single person that would, would be able to praise the Lord and know his name, know his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy, everything that we celebrate when we come together in this place as his people, that we would be able to experience that, live that, and know that as we, as we share that and live that out as loving other people in this world. And therefore, we ask Christ to Jesus to fill us. And then it goes on and says that the earth has yielded its increase, God. Our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. And so when we, when we read a, a, a psalm like this, when we pray a psalm like this, when we sing a psalm like this, like we just did, we are emptying ourselves and filling ourselves with God's word. We're saying, change us in our very behaviors our very habits, our very ways that we love people, Lord. Prepare us to be ready to share your love in this world with every single person we come across. It becomes a challenging task, but we look not to ourselves to do it, but Jesus to teach us and the Holy Spirit to guide us and put us on that path. And in the end of the psalm, we hear this very thing that happens in church every single Sunday. Jesus blesses us. Jesus blesses us you. He blesses you and puts that blessing upon you to send you out with that readiness, to know that he's done the work for you. He's died and and rose again from the dead to forgive you, renew you, to put you in the path to do this. Sometimes when we get into this conversation about understanding how we love other people or we, this sanctification conversation, which basically means the, the works that we do, we get confused as Lutherans because we want to make sure that none of our works equal salvation. And, and we know that. Jesus died and rose again. The only way that we have are forgiven and redeemed and restored is because of Jesus. But Luther used to say, Jesus doesn't need our works. God doesn't need our works. But our neighbor does. And so we're praying then, okay, Jesus, you've done the work. How do you prepare us? And in this, we hear that promise that he blesses you. He loves you so much that he would have done anything to have that relationship with you. He died and rose again. He lived perfectly. As we see him bring a man who was hurting before him, trying to be set into a trap, we see that Jesus wants to immediately heal that man no matter what other people think. And that can give us great sense of joy of just how much God wants to bless us, just how much Jesus wants to bless us, prepare us, and take care of us is that he sees our needs. And then he gives us the wonderful opportunity. He transforms us from ordinary people to extraordinary servants to love other people in this world. 
And so my prayer for us as Mount Calvary, extraordinary servants, people of God, is that disciples of Christ we're ready to see and be filled with God's word every single morning as we read it, as we worship him, as we sing it, as we walk into the day where we feel that selfishness as the world has thrown at us all sorts of ways that we want to react and we want to respond. And we say, Lord Jesus, fill us so that we're ready to love all your people, that they would come to your saving love, that they would know what I know, their grace and mercy and forgiveness. If it can be one small way, whether it's bunt cakes or telling them encouraging words or writing a note or a phone call or just walking alongside somebody in, in loving them in a way where you're able to speak words into them when you see what a challenging day they're having. God has prepared you to do that. And I pray that we get back to that grassroots loving. That God allows us and enables you to see the people before you and love them with all that you have. Let's pray. Jesus, we battle with our sinful, our sinful selfishness every day. Forgive us. Renew us with the soundtrack of your word to love like you. May we see each person in this world as your creation, which you died for, and help us to know how to love them. Amen.